Hello, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where in the world you are joining us from. We're so glad that you could be here today. We're going to start with a few housekeeping items before we get uh, before we launch today's presentation. We are recording this presentation for those who may not have been able to attend live today. So we want to try to mitigate the distractions and ensure that everyone has a pleasant experience. So we encourage you to keep your microphone on mute, uh, keep your video turned off, but please do feel free to type your questions in the chat. We do have time allotted at the end of the presentation to address your questions, but we don't want you to forget them. So feel free as we're going along to type them in the chat. If we can get to them in real time, we will try to do that. Otherwise, uh, we will certainly address them at the end. Today is our part, what we call part two of our virtual open house series. And we're going to be talking about application tips. Now, if you haven't had a chance to view part one, or if you're not familiar with our open house series, we put together this series of events because we know that if you're thinking about graduate school, whether that be you know, a graduate certificate or a master's program or a doctoral program, that you have a lot of factors that you're considering. You have a lot of questions and you're you know, thinking about a lot of things. And so we put together this series of events that will address some of those frequently asked questions that we know that you have, but also give you an opportunity to interact with many of the different members at Fielding. You know, if you've attended any of our information sessions, you, know, you had the opportunity to interact with faculty, uh, but we want you to have a sense of all of the people that you will be supporting you before, during, and after your journey. And so that is really the whole purpose of this series so that you can make a very confident decision for yourself and moving forward with your graduate program. Today's presentation is specifically about application tips. And it's really perfect for anyone who's ever wondered, what do they do with all of these materials? Do they even read my essay? Do they care about my GPA if I graduated 20 years ago? Um, all of those are very common questions. And that's really the whole purpose is we want to demystify that process for you and give you some tips so that you can approach your application with the most amount of confidence, whether that be here at Fielding or anywhere else should you, uh, should you decide to apply. My name is Erica Fichter. I'm the Director of Recruitment and Admission at Fielding. I've been in my role here for about two and a half years, but I've been in graduate admissions for um, about a decade now. And I've had the opportunity to sit on panels both domestically and around the world to provide many of the tips that we're gonna be talking about today. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to share with you some of those insights that I have learned over the course of my career, uh, having gone through two master's programs myself and having worked with prospective uh, graduate students for, for, for a very long time. So very excited to be here today. And I'm going to hand it off to the rest of my panel to introduce themselves as well. Hi everyone, my name is Caroline Wedderburn and I'm the Senior Admissions Advisor for the programs within our School of Leadership Studies. So I know I've spoken with some of you already, it's great to see you here. And just so you're aware, uh, I'm located in Santa Barbara, California, uh, where we're headquartered, and I've been with Fielding for three years now. As an admissions advisor, I really enjoy learning about what you're all already doing, as well as your motivations and goals to bring about positive changes in your respective fields, communities, and organizations through our graduate programs. So thank you so much for being here today and allowing us to be part of your higher education journeys. Hello everyone, my name is Brian Wallen and I'm the admissions advisor for our clinically oriented programs here at Fielding. And I'm so excited to be able to assist you in deciding if Fielding is the right fit for you and see you to see you take the next steps towards achieving your goals. Just a quick note, if there is anyone here who's interested in our clinical psychology programs, I do just want to highlight that today's presentation is geared towards our non-clinical programs, so much of the information presented in the first part of the presentation may not be directly applicable to you. We do have an application workshop designed specifically for our clinical psychology program scheduled for Saturday, September 18th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And I'll go ahead and share a link to register for that event in our chat box here in just a moment as well. 
Now we will be sharing some information about the layout of the application portal today as well. And that layout will look very similar regardless of the program that you're applying to. So please feel free to stay tuned for that part of the presentation as well. Thank you so much everyone for the opportunity to be here. And now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Ignacio. Hi everyone, my name is Ignacio Vargas. I am celebrating my one year anniversary with Fielding coming up this month. And I am the admissions advisor for the media psychology programs, the PhD in psychology program, and the infant and early child development program here at Fielding. I'm very excited to have all of you join us here today. And I look forward to sharing some more application tips so that way you are best prepared to submit your application here at Fielding and get a good shot of uh, joining one of our programs here. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of my wonderful team and colleagues. Um, and thank you, Brian, for pointing that out about the, the clinical PhD program and that uh, workshop coming up. Um, that's a wonderful suggestion for those interested in that program. I do want to state that this, this is going to be kind of a collaborative presentation today. So as we get into these specific tips for each of the specific parts of the application, um, you know, several people on the panel might jump in with their own thoughts and things that they are going to add. So uh, we do expect this to be a pretty collaborative presentation for you today. Well, some of the things we want to cover uh, first are the committee considerations. So what, what are some of those main things the committee is thinking about as they're reviewing your documents and thinking about whether or not, um, you know, whether or not to be able to extend an offer of admission. We're going to go through different admissions documents um, and talk about the reasons that the committee would ask for these things. Uh, we'll discuss some best practices as you approach each of those aspects of the application. We're going to walk through the application portal at Fielding for those wanting to uh, submit an application here so you can become really comfortable and familiar with that process. And then discuss some of the next steps and tell you about the, uh, the remainder of the events happening in our open house. And as promised, we will have time at the end to address your questions. So the whole thing, the whole reason we wanted to do this particular presentation today is to really demystify the admissions process. Um, so it, in, for the most part, any, any program that's going to have a very holistic review process, which in my experience, um, for the most part, graduate programs do. However, there are programs such as our PhD in clinical psychology that do have very specific requirements. So regardless, we always encourage you to connect with the admissions advisors at any of the programs that you're considering and ask them you know, what their committee is looking for and make sure that you feel really comfortable with that process. But in general, these tips are, are pretty across the board going to be relevant um, in most cases. So what is the committee thinking as they're looking through your application? It seems pretty nebulous, but it boils down to some pretty basic things. Is this the right program for you? Is this the right place for you? And is this the right time for you to be starting a program? So we're going to jump into each of these a little bit, um, but before we do that, we want to quickly take some time and talk about program the programs at Fielding uh, so that you can feel oriented for the rest of this presentation. Within our School of Psychology, we do offer a PhD in clinical psychology. Um, that is the only APA accredited PhD in clinical psychology offered in a distributed format. We are very excited that we have just launched a three-year totally virtual PhD in general psychology. Uh, that will be, we started this fall and have our next intake coming up in January. We offer a doctoral master's and certificate in the exciting world of media psychology where human behavior and technology intersect. We offer a doctoral degree in infant early childhood development uh, with an emphasis in infant middle health. And we also offer a post back certificate in clinical psychology for those who may be interested in a PhD in clinical psychology, but maybe not have some of the research or other uh, backgrounds or skills that those, those programs are specifically looking for. So that one year uh, virtual program can help to assist you and make you a more competitive applicant for the clinical program. And we offer a postdoctoral certificate respecialization in clinical psychology and a two year neuropsychology specialization training program. Within our School of Leadership Studies, we offer doctoral degrees in education, human development, and organizational development and change. And for those of you who may have uh, semi-recent uh, doctoral level credits, we also have a degree completion program. We have uh, relaunched in a very 
innovative and exciting master's degree in organization development and leadership. We have been offering master's degrees in, in this space for 25 years now, but this year uh, we've retooled and it can be completed in one year uh, with a very innovative design. And we offer a certificate in evidence-based coaching that is an accredited coach training program and will prepare you for ICF credentials. So now that we've talked a little bit about the program, um, we want to talk about that first, that first consideration I, I was mentioning. So um, is this the right program for you? What do you want to do? And that's how we that's how we understand that. So what are you hoping to accomplish? This is really about your long-term goals. And there's many different places where the committee is looking for that information. And the first one is your personal statement. And that's why that piece is really important. And that's why programs ask for those. And we really do read those. Um, and then some of the future slides will go into a little bit more depth about how to approach that personal statement with confidence. Um, but that is a, such an important aspect of it because that's what we're trying to understand. Okay, why is this person interested in this program? So we can help understand is this program actually going to help you do that? Because the last thing that we want is to admit you into a program that isn't actually going to help you to achieve your goals. No one wins that way. Um, so that is a really important part uh, and a big part of the consideration is making sure it's a good match for what you're hoping to accomplish. For programs that require letters of recommendation, uh, that's another piece that we could look at for that. So again, when we talk about preparing your references to submit letters of recommendation, um, that's that's an important aspect because they can help to just supplement and further submit the fact that this is the right program based on what they understand of your goals as well. When it comes to your resume or your CV, it's helpful because it kind of fills in some of those, those pieces where the committee can see how your past experience has shaped your future goals. And then faculty and staff engagement. And um, this may or may not be a surprise to you, but this is something that, you know, is, is, is um, comes up is going to come up in, in all of these different pieces because that can also help us to understand if we're the right program or the right place for you. When it comes to the right place, you know, saying the right fit is so important. Um, and if any of you were able to join the first, uh, the first event in our open house series, uh, all about fielding, that's what we really talked a lot about fit because the culture, um, it, well, part of it is the culture, but all, part of it is about the delivery model uh, or the community. There's lots of different things about the actual institution you're applying to uh, where you want to make sure it's the right fit and you're going to you're going to feel at home there, you're going to be happy there. Uh, and so that's a mutual thing. We want to make sure you're a good fit. You want to make sure we're a good fit. Um, so that piece is really important. And that's something that can also come out in your personal statement. Um, that's a place many programs are wanting to know, you know, why do you want to do this program? But also, why do you want to do this program here at our institution? So, um, you know, as I mentioned, we'll get more into that, uh, you know, approaching that. But that is another way that we that we can see that. And again, through those letters of recommendation and the engagement that you have with our faculty and staff kind of helps us understand if it's a good mutual fit. And then finally, is this the right time? So, you know, say your goals are aligned, you, you know, this program can help you accomplish your goals. It seems to be a really good fit with you and the institution, um, but then is, is this the right time for you? Are you ready to be able to dedicate the amount of time that it takes to be successful in a graduate program? You know, are you, are you prepared for that, you know, for your, with your support system? Are you financially prepared for that? All of those different things. The time is also a very important piece of that. And so that again, is something we could see reflected in your personal statement as you talk about the why. Uh, why do you want to do the program here? Why do you want to do this program? Why do you want to do it now? Why is this the right time for you? Again, that can come through with your letters of recommendation when your references talk about, you know, how this program is going to help you. Um, if they also feeling confident, this is a great time for you. And, th and this is where your, your academic performance can certainly come in when looking at your, your undergraduate transcripts or your other graduate program work that you have done to see, you know, ha has this person shown academic success? Um, do we feel confident that if we admit you into this program that you're going to be successful and that we're setting you up to be successful? Um, and that's not the only place that we can see that, but that certainly can be part of it. For programs that require writing samples, um, as a few of our programs do, that's another place to see, you know, what is your, what is your level of academic writing? And none of this, you know, you're, it's not expected that you're coming in with any of these things to be perfect because a lot of these things you're going to learn during the program but it does give us some information about whether or not you're prepared and can be successful at this time. 
And then again, that level of engagement of faculty and staff uh, will help us to understand if, if this is the right time for you as well. So now that we've talked a little bit about the programs we offer and what it means to be the right program, the right place, the right time, and which of your materials are used to evaluate those things, we want to talk a little bit about best practices for each of these, uh, each piece of your application. And this is where the rest of my panel might jump in with their own insights or added, uh, added bits of information for you. Uh, first, we're going to start with the resume or the CV, and uh, we want to talk about why we ask for this. Um, so we ask for this so we can understand you in a professional manner. So what, um, you know, what have you been doing in your career? And again, how has, the, how has that experience helped to shape what you're going to do in the future? Uh, but it also shows all of the great things that you're going to bring into the program. And one of the great things about a graduate program uh, is that you know, typically you have a very diverse, uh, you're, you're in a classroom with a very diverse set of, of colleagues. So everyone has different types of experiences. Um, they come from different industries. They come from different functional areas. Um, so being able to see, you know, what are you, what are you bringing to the table, but also how has that really shaped you where you are today um, and prepared you for what you're hoping to do in the future. So some best practices, um, you know, try to keep it usually, if, if asking for a resume, um, a couple of pages is usually fine. Um, there is a difference between a resume and a CV. Um, so, you know, find out what they're looking for. And a lot of, a lot of times that uh, there could be an either or situation. Um, you know, for resumes is going to be much more about your education and your professional experience, uh, where a CV is going to go more into any publications that you've had, um, any presentations that you've done at conferences and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, try to be careful in, in not using too much jargon, um, and especially if it's, uh, you know, one of those, uh, I, well, we all have many different acronyms <laughs> in, our, in our different industries, but try not to use so much of that if it's not something that we can easily recognize. Um, and focus more on listing accomplishments instead of just the, the, the list of, of, uh, of of tasks that you've done in that particular job. Um, some schools may have specific requirements. Fielding does not, but some schools may have a requirement about you know, keeping it to two pages or one page if you're asking for a resume. So um, that could be a great thing for you to ask about those requirements if, if you don't see that clearly listed. Uh, but don't overlook requirements if, if they're given to you because they're generally given to you for a reason. Um, and that is, um, and that, that is, actually pretty relevant for, for all of the different aspects of the application. But um, is there anything else that any of my panelists would like to add to this section? Yes, uh, so in regards to applying to the program, if you are, you know, have certain experiences in certain um, industries and such, and the program does align with that, for example, if you're working in organizational development and such, then you wanna make sure you have your relevant experiences first. The infant and early child development program have some relevant experience there so definitely just kind of learn more about the program and definitely try to have your most relevant experiences at first at the very top of, of your resume or cv and then for your resumes you want to make sure that you contextualize your impact by including numbers on your accomplishments as well so if your results can be quantified you want to make sure you can have that included in your resume and then for your cv you want to make sure that you can highlight how you overcame challenges as well and some publications and credit um, how you were able to complete these programs and your accomplishments in them as well. Um, that's another thing to include in your resume and CV. This will be really helpful to show the admissions committee your impact that you've made in your communities, in your organizations and such, and thus can be also reflected into the programs as well. So that's definitely a good a tip to keep in mind. Excellent advice there. Thank you. Um, moving along to uh, Transcripts. Um, so why do we ask for transcripts? Well, again, to, to get to know you in a way to see what your past academic experience has been, uh, what you focused on. Again, that can help us understand how that may have shaped uh, your experience after your, after your graduation or your, your, your future goals. And it can help understand your readiness for graduate level work um, with the caveat that the this is the one part of your application you cannot change, right? We don't expect you to go do another undergraduate degree if, say, you know, you um, that you didn't maybe have the focus area or didn't achieve the GPA you were hoping for. 
Um, for many of us, that could be because you were juggling multiple things while you were trying to complete your undergraduate degree, or maybe um, it, you were just very young and you know wasn't really sure about how to how to really focus yourself and and do your best work. So we we understand those things. But we also understand that that doesn't necessarily mean you can't be successful in a graduate program, because typically one of the exciting things about graduate work is that you're you're doing something you're passionate about. You're deciding to do a graduate program because you're passionate about the subject. And when you're passionate about something, um, you put yourself into it more and you and you you give you give yourself to it. Versus in our undergraduate degree, um, you know, maybe we're just kind of trying to figure out what we wanted to do, taking a lot of courses that uh, are required, but maybe we're not so passionate about. So committees understand that. Um, and it may be the case that, you know, you graduated 10, 20 years ago. So how relevant is that? compared to everything you've accomplished since then uh, is, is not so relevant. So, um, so there's, you know, we asked for the transcripts to understand that, but that's not the end all be all of the decision making process. Um, so I know that can be a, a point of a little bit of anxiety for some people if you didn't perform as well in undergrad and thinking that's going to prohibit you from being able to do a graduate program. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, there may be situations where um, it, it, and this is generally where those one-on-one -on -one conversations with either the admissions team or a member of the faculty, um, if, if there is a situation where it may behoove of you to take a, a community college course or another course, um, or if you've completed, you know, other graduate level work that you can show, you know, I, I was, can be successful at the graduate level, um, there, there are lots of things that can help to overcome that. Uh, so we just want to take a moment and talk about the fact that we realize that. Um, but when it comes to best practices, you know, really be, be realistic, one, in, in the timeline. Um, some of our programs have degree verification at fielding where you don't have to submit transcripts, um, but many of them do require transcripts. So one of those things is thinking about the timing, understanding how to get those transcripts from your university, um, and exhibiting self-awareness. And this will come up when we get to the, uh, the statement of purpose, but you know, if you if you didn't perform very well at the undergraduate level, uh, then you know you, it may be something that you want to discuss in your personal statement about you know stating this is this was a situation, um, but this is what this the, this is what's changed, or this is why this is not going to be an issue for me moving forward. Um, so that's what we talk about exhibiting that self awareness. Um, don't don't wait to order. Don't wait to the last minute. That that happens you know from time to time and. Um, it can definitely heighten that level of anxiety trying to get your application finished and get an admission decision. Um, and, you know, talk about, op give yourself opportunity to showcase your academic strength. Um, I know my colleague Caroline had some, some information she wanted to share too uh, about ordering transcripts, but does anyone else have anything they want to add about um, best practices for this? I can go in and add some information too. Depending on the program as well, we do have like certain GPA requirements for certain programs, uh, but we do consider the holistic review. So even if your GPA for your undergraduate or your graduate level degree transcript does not meet the minimum GPA, your application will still be considered um, holistically <clears throat> along with your other application documents. But to double check, please check in with your admissions advisor to get more information about this as well. Thank you, that's a great point. All right, Caroline, do you want to talk to us a little bit about ordering transcripts? Yes, absolutely. And I see we already have a few questions in the chat about that. So it is a great question. And as Erica highlighted, if you have any particular questions, please be sure to reach out to your admissions advisor specifically to make sure that you have the right information for the program you're applying for, as well as uh, your wherever your transcript was from. The ordering process might be a little bit different. But when applying to a doctoral program at Fielding, an official transcript is required. So again, please be sure to review the official transcript requirements for the particular program you're applying for, as some certificate programs will allow a degree verification option if your degree was earned within the US. Now again, there are additional instructions for the specific program you're applying for within the application. But in terms of ordering an official transcript from a university within the United States, most universities have instructions for their ordering process on their website. So start there 
and the majority of universities offer an electronic option to have the official transcript sent to fielding. And that is typically a 24 to 48 hour process. So if your school has that option, you'll wanna order the electronic delivery method. Now, if your school only offers a traditional mailing option, you can still have the official transcript mailed to fielding as well. But please keep in mind, uh, the official transcript does need to be sent directly from your school to fielding unless you had previously ordered one from your school and it is still in the sealed envelope from them with the stamp. Now our physical mailing address is located at the bottom of our email signatures and at the bottom of nearly every page of our website. And again, if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to reach your admissions advisor for clarifications. Perfect. Thank you. And I, I know you keep saying that, and it is such a great point that that is what we are here for. Um, it is very rare that any two people have the exact same situation. So uh, we are here to work with you individually and what uh, and help you determine what it works best for your situation. So on the same lines as transcripts, Caroline is going to talk to us about international transcripts. Yes. So if your degree was received outside of the U.S., you will need to request an international transcript evaluation. This is to establish equiv equivalency with a regionally accredited US degree. You'll need to request an evaluation that lists each class with grades and a cumulative GPA. This is generally called a course by course evaluation. When you go to the ordering agencies, they'll have different types of evaluations you can order, you'll want to order the course by course evaluation. And you would provide an official transcript to the evaluation agency according to their processes and request that they send the evaluation directly to fielding. Again, we accept evaluations from a number of different agencies which are listed on our website. There's a few of them on the screen here, World Education Services, Spantran Pathways, uh, but you can order them from any of the agencies listed on the National Association of Credential Evaluation Services. Again, there are links to all of those agencies on our website. And again, if you have questions about your prior degree, <laughs> what we need, please don't hesitate to reach us. We'll be happy to provide clarification and further instructions for you. Thank you so much. All right, this is probably my favorite thing to talk about. A statement of purpose because um well i've just read so many of them in my life and i know you know some of this might seem might seem uh, pretty obvious but the fact that we're talking about it means that we've certainly seen situations where maybe it's not so obvious so uh, so we definitely want to talk about them um just in case and hope to to fill in some blanks for you but uh the statement of purpose is such an important part of the application uh, it's our introduction to you you know i like to say it kind of where you become more of a a three-dimensional person, and we we really get to know you. Um, your resume can tell us, you know, where you've been and what you've what you've achieved, but it doesn't tell us really anything about who you are. So this is such an important piece. Uh, it helps us understand again that program, place, and time. Why do you want to do this program? Why do you want to do it here? And why do you think this is the right time for you? Uh, so it, it's really important part of it. I mean, I've read I've read essays where I laughed, where I cried. And really, you know, felt that wanting to advocate um, for for that applicant by because I really got to know them through that essay. So it, it really is an important piece of it, and it should be a really easy thing to do. It should be easy uh, if you if you know you know what where you're hoping to do this. You're you're just talking about yourself. So um, you know, I, I really hope to alleviate some anxiety about this because it's um, well, one of the don'ts I have here is don't Google how to write a grad school essay because this really should be very authentic. Uh, it should your authentic voice should shine through um, when we read essays that sound like you know someone googled how to write a grad school essay uh, you we don't get the opportunity to know you as a person and to feel that wanting to advocate for you uh, for you to be admitted so you know be, be use your authentic voice um, but also you know proofread <laughs> there are some pretty basic things here but I have seen many essays where um, you know the, the, a couple of proofreads would have done a a great deal of service for the applicant. Um, you know, have someone else proofread and make sure that you know that it's that it's and the grammar is right. All of those things are correct, um, and make sure that you are are actually addressing the questions that university asked. 
many times there may be some places will just say write a statement of purpose. Um, but a lot of programs might have specific things they want you to address in that statement of purpose. And if they do, it's for a very specific reason. So you definitely want to make sure you're addressing those. And that's where it's really important to tailor your statement of purpose for the individual programs and universities you're applying to. Yes, a lot of that information might be similar. Um, when it comes to you know, the place, and we want to know why are you interested in this particular place, um, that's hard to see if you don't really do take some time to tailor it and help us understand why you're interested in our university versus doing that, a, a similar program somewhere else. So that is important. Not to mention, uh, several times in my career, I have read essays that were addressed to a completely different school. <laughs> Um, so I can tell you find and replace does not always work. Uh, so again, that's where proofread is important, but also, you know, you want to take some time to really tailor that. Um, and also fill in the blanks. So this is where, you know, if there are things in your application that, um, that may cause concern to the committee. So this is where it goes back to that. Maybe your undergraduate GPA, um, you know, wasn't very solid. You want to address it. You want to address, you know, what had transpired. Um, and really, you know, not make excuses, but but uh, be accountable for whatever transpired or whatever the situation was, and what you've learned or or what's changed and why why this won't be an issue moving forward. So those types of things help to really fill in the blanks for the committee. Um, again, in those specific instructions, you know, if they have the questions and you don't answer them, I have had committees send essays back to me that says this person doesn't even address this, you know, why are they, why did they want to do this program? So those are definitely important pieces. Um, so the statement of purpose, yes, we absolutely read them. It is an important part, um, but you get to be authentic and really talk about why you're excited and what you're hoping to accomplish um, and talk about your hopes and dreams. So, um, so I, I hope you can uh, approach this um, with excitement and not anxiety. Does anyone else have anything they want to add to this? Just one thing to add, following in line with the uh, um, paying attention to the specific instructions. A lot of times there is a, a page limit for these. Be sure to, to stick within the page limits or any any writing styles that are, they're asking for, for example, single spaced or double spaced and things like that as well. Um, it, it could be a bit of a red flag if you don't follow those kinds of instructions in the uh, in the statement of purpose. So just keep that in mind as well. That is a really important point, Brian. And depending on the school, Fielding doesn't do this, but there are some schools that may, if they say, you know, keep it to two pages or three or five pages, whatever it is, they may actually stop reading after that point. So uh, that is an important point um, and why we keep talking about specific instructions. So thank you for bringing that up. All right, now moving on to letters of recommendation. First off, not all programs require letters of recommendation. Uh, at Fielding, our School of Leadership Studies, none of our leadership studies programs require recommendations. Um, but all of the programs within our School of Clinical of School of Psychology uh, generally do require letters of recommendation. So why do programs ask for these? Um, to get to know you again, but more objectively. So it helps us to understand things like how you interact with others or you know, things that, um, things that stood out to your recommender about, you know, your leadership or your, your goals and your interest, um, and just depending on the program, because generally there are going to be prompts or specific questions um, that may be asked of that recommender to address. Some may not, some may just ask for, you know, submit a letter of recommendation. Uh, so you want to understand for each of the schools how they, re how they request letters of recommendation, how they want them submitted, um, and th all of those pieces are important because it helps you to prepare your references. And that is really the most important thing for the do section. Make sure they're prepared, you know, send them, well, first ask them if they are able to provide a positive recommendation for you. Um, generally that's, you know, something that you want to know up front uh, and if they're willing to provide a positive recommendation for you, you if it's been a while since you've, um, since you've spoken with them or, or worked with them, um, you want to provide them a copy of your most up-to-date resume or a CV. Uh, you may want to remind them of certain achievements that you made or projects that you worked on um, so that they don't have to, you know, uh, try to dig back in their memory bank themselves and, and pull those things out. But it is important to prepare them and let them know why you're hoping to, why you're wanting to do this program. So the more you, you're able to prepare them, the stronger recommendation they can write for you 
uh, that really shows the committee why this is a good program for you or why you will be successful in the program. Be careful who you select for your references. Um, certain programs will have certain requirements for that. Um, our clinical psychology programs are looking for academic references, uh, but for the most part, many programs are looking for professional references. So understanding what the program is looking for is an important aspect of that. But generally speaking, uh, and I know this may seem obvious, but I have seen it, so we're saying it. <laughs> um, don't ask your parents to submit recommendations or family members. We would hope that they will say wonderful things about you. Um, some of the caveats might be, you know, what if I work for a family business? How does that work? Um, in those types of cases, it's generally better to reach out to a vendor or a client or something like that. Um, so again, that's where if you have questions about that, you're not really sure who to select. That's why our, our admissions advisors are here um, to help you through that and understand what's best for you in your particular situation. Um, and then understanding how each school accepts letters of recommendation. Uh, at Fielding, we have an, we have an electronic form that uh, when you enter their email address in the system, uh, they receive a message with that electronic form that they submit electronically back to us. So um, that is how we accept them, but it will certainly help you uh, as, to prepare those references if you understand for each of the programs you're applying to um, how they're going to be looking for those to be submitted. Does anyone else have anything to add to this section? Okay. I guess the one other don't I haven't brought up yet is submitting out of date letters. Um, depending on the program, if you have letters that are several years old, um, it is generally we will ask that you reach out to that reference um, and ask them to at, at least respond and say that you know they still stand by that uh, or that you know they are comfortable with you submitting that um, at, at this time. Uh, but generally speaking, you you want to get uh, recent references. All right, moving on to writing samples or reflective essays. Not all programs require this. Again, um, at building only our, our doctoral programs require this, uh, and the requirements are different for the different programs. Um, but this is really about that, that timing piece and understanding if you're, if you're prepared to be successful in the program, understand your critical thinking skills, your academic writing skills, um, at Fielding, and I'm sure many other universities, there are uh, a lot of support services for writing. So again, we don't expect you to come in um, having perfect academic writing skills. That's something that you learn as you become a, a, a PhD or an EDD. As you become a, 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 a graduate of a doctoral program, you, you look, that's something that you learn throughout that program. Um, but it is important to have a baseline um, to, to be sure that you're gonna be successful um, and that you'll, you'll be able to um, successfully manage the, the program. Again, um, you know, showcase your position on the subject. If they're asking you to write an argument about, you know, some, about an article, um, you know, be, be, use your authentic voice and what you really think. I think that's one of the beauties of, of this type, these types of programs. I know that our students are very encouraged to, uh, to bring their, their true voice and their opinions into things and um, help to, to challenge your classmates. So, you know, bring your, bring your authentic voice in on this. Um, we encourage you to get started those, on those things early. So again, minimizes and, and doesn't cause you anxiety trying to get them done the last minute. Um, please, uh, we, we don't encourage you to use old writing samples. So if you have specifically, this is just good advice in general. If you have applied to a program and were not admitted and you're applying again in a future term, uh, it's always a good idea. Anything that can be changed, anything that um, like updated, like the writing samples, personal statements, you want to you want to amend them. You don't want to reuse the old writing samples that you submitted before. Um, and and please don't complain about the articles. Again, it may seem obvious, but it has happened. Uh, the, there are very specific requirements that we have when we select articles. Uh, so please just keep that in mind. Um, Caroline, did you want to talk a little bit about some of the options for, for these within your programs? I know that there are um, some different options and some frequently asked questions that we get about this. Sure, yes. Uh, for the reflective, or I apologize, uh, for the, 
the writing sample for the PhD in human development, as well as the PhD in organizational development and change, there is an option to use a writing sample from something you've written previously. So if you've had graduate level courses, uh, usually within the last eight years, if there's an academic paper you would like to use, you can provide that, just upload it to the application. Otherwise, there are two, uh, two choices to write on. So there are two prompts to choose from if you don't have anything recent academically that you wanna provide. So lots of options for the PhD in human development and the PhD in organizational development and change. Again, this is why we're highlighting to review the instructions thoroughly. Don't just assume they're all the same. Um, they do vary per program. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add to this section before we move on? All right. Actually, um, oh. I was just going to check on a question and possibly address it here. Um, if you applied as well, uh, for example, for the master's program at Fielding, say in media psychology, and you've gone through that program and are now ready to apply for the PhD, it is a different application. So you'll the, the requirements might be a little bit different. So you, you shouldn't use the writing sample from the master's program application. You'll wanna be sure to, to provide a new writing sample for the, the PhD application. Thank you. Okay. So to summarize all of that, um, Really, the committee is wondering, and, and you are too, right? That's something that you're trying to figure out. Is this the right program for you? Is building the right place for you? Or is whatever place that you're considering the right place for you? And this is, is this the right time for you? So those same considerations that you're making, the committee is making at the same time. So for those of you who feel this is the right place and we do have the right program and this is the right time, Brian is going to now walk us through the application portal. Thank you, Erica. And before getting into the details here, I want to just point out that you may log in and out of this application portal as needed all the way up until the application deadline for your program. So you can get started on an application whenever you're ready. If you want to take a look at the various prompts and requirements for your program specifically, you can get started at any time and then you have all the way until the application deadline to log in and out and work as your, your time is, uh, or as your schedule permits. And to get started with the application, you can navigate to nearly any of the fielding web pages to locate a yellow apply now button in the upper part of the page. On nearly any of our pages, it's on the middle of the, the page right at the top. And after clicking on that apply now button, you'll see a registration screen. If you've already created an account, you can go ahead and click the back to login button at the bottom of this page to enter your, new, your username and password to log in. You can also reset your password from that login page if needed. After logging in or creating your account, you'll be taken to the application portal homepage. Down the road, this is also where you'll find your application checklist, um, which you can see outlined by the red box towards the bottom center of this image. To work on or get started with your application though, you'll click on the My Applications tab towards the top of this page. Once you've clicked on the My Applications tab, you may see one or multiple applications listed depending on if you've applied or started an application before. Be sure to click on your active application as indicated by the word active in parentheses following the application ID. Before the full application is populated, you'll need to complete the first three sections in the portal. So that's the demographic information, the contact information, and the program information. Once these sections are completed, the rest of your application will become available and populated based on the program information section. Now keep in mind that the required fields are indicated by the red line to the left of the fillable sections. So all of those will need to be completed in order to submit your application. And you can see on this slide here that once the first three sections are complete, the entire application is populated. And the rest of the application will allow you to move from section to section so you can complete that, them at different times. And you can click on the, the blue links on the left-hand side to jump from section to section as well. 
All of the instructions to, oh, sorry, Erica, if you could go back to that last slide. Um, all of the instructions to complete the application are included within the various sections, so be sure to, to read them carefully. Pay particular attention to how to order the transcripts or an international transcript evaluation. Caroline did cover this information today as well, but you can find the same details in this portal, so if you have any questions, you can also find them there. Also, for letters of recommendation, um, if required for your program, we have you enter in the names and contact information for your recommenders. Then once all of the recommenders are entered in, so two or three, depending on the program, and you click on save and continue, we send an email out to your recommenders on your behalf, requesting that they upload a letter to a uniquely generated portal. That letter should be PDF, um, and if, they have, if you have any questions, just let us know as well. Also, if you're looking for any prompts or writing samples, reflective essays, or statement of purpose, you can find those prompts under the Supplemental Application Document section, and that's also where you'll upload PDF copies of those materials. Then you can simply progress through these sections um, as, you, as you desire, one by one or, or in an order, however you please, to complete the application. And you can go to the next slide. Finally, once everything is completed, you can go ahead and submit your application. Normally, there is a $75 application fee, but as a thank you for joining us at our open house series, we will be applying a fee waiver to all of the accounts for our attendees. You don't have to do anything to make this fee waiver active. The waiver will bypass the fee payment page, so you don't need to click on the payment page directly. And once your sections are completed, you will be able to click on that submit application button down at the bottom and the, the fee payment page will just be bypassed. So you don't have to do anything on your end. We have lots of resources and upcoming events to help you learn more and plan ahead. So now Caroline will take over and talk through some of those next steps you can take in this process. Thank you, Brian. And we do understand everyone's situation is different and you may have particular questions, which is why we're all here to help. If you haven't already spoken with an admissions advisor, you're welcome to connect with us by phone or email. And we understand if you have a very busy schedule as well and want to coordinate a call ahead of time, we can provide you with our appointment calendars to schedule a time that works best for you. In addition to speaking with an admissions advisor and program directors, our financial aid team is also available to connect with even before you decide to apply. You can do so by reaching them by phone, email, or using their appointment calendar to schedule a time. Just let us know if you need that link, we can give it to you as well. And then our next virtual open house series is dedicated to this topic as well. Uh, funding your education, making your goal a reality. My colleague Amanda Green and I will be sharing more information about the various ways students fund their education at Fielding, including scholarships, student loans, military and veterans benefits, employer assistance, and more. Part four, excited or scared, is a couple weeks after. If you're feeling either excited or scared or a combination of those, attend this webinar and ask us your lingering questions. We'd love to hear how excited you are as well about starting or continuing your higher education journey at this time. And if you have any program specific questions, all of our programs have information sessions typically twice a month and the week of October 18th, there'll be a student panel Q&A for our doctoral programs. This specific event will be hosted by the program directors, lead faculty members, who are amazing resources for the program specific questions that you might still have that week of the application deadline for our spring term. Uh, so there are so many different ways to stay engaged. If you have any pressing questions, simply email admissions at fielding.edu or give us a call at 805-898-4026. But at this time, we will be opening it up for questions as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian, for walking us through the portal and Caroline for talking about our next steps and our different options that we have coming up. Um, I do want to point out we have on there the PhD in general psychology. We will not have a student panel for that program as our first students are actually starting the program this fall. We've just launched that program, so I do want to make that clarification and apologize, uh, apologize for that. But 
we look forward to having one in the future uh, once our students are are fully engaged um, and can can really give you some information about that program. All right, let's go through and see what types of questions we have. Brian has added his appointment link. Thank you for that. All right. And there we have a general question that yeah. I just wanted to clarify for the whole group. The there was the question was if we require GRE scores. And please note, you know, for any of our programs, we don't require GRE scores. Thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions? I see, it looks like my colleagues have tried to be answering those in the chat along the way. So appreciate you doing that. We have about nine or 10 minutes left. Um, but again, if there are, if you don't have questions today, you know, you can feel free to uh, reach us at any point in time with those questions or one of these future events coming up. Um, I'll just say thank you to everyone for your time. I know it is a very precious commodity. I have a question, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. My question is about um, the application. I said, because somebody said something that is a Nigerian that is not qualified for it, so I was confused. Because me, I want to study in those... I, I can touch on some of those questions and I'd be happy to correspond with you via email directly just you know, regarding your particular application. But uh, please note applications for the PhD in organizational development and change are currently open for spring, summer and fall 2022. If you have already started an application and selected a particular term of interest, you, you're not able to change it uh, directly, but you can contact us requesting we change that for you. So if you started it for spring 2022, but your intention was fall 2022, um, I can have that change for you uh, with our operations team. And thank you. I'll yes, give I'll course. I'll send you an email. Perfect. Yes, yeah, so I can assist you with getting that changed. But the applications are open again for spring, summer, and fall. You're welcome to work on it as you need up until the application deadline. And for that program, you know, we do welcome students from within the United States as well as internationally. We ha currently have students across the globe in 30 different countries, including the US. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, for the PhD in clinical psychology, that program does have a number of in-person components, including a practicum and an internship. So there are geographic eligibility requirements so, for that so program. So what you're trying, sorry, please, what you're trying to say is that as a Nigerian, I cannot apply for industrial, I can only apply for clinical. No, uh, <laughs> you can apply for the majority of our programs at Fielding. The only program that has eligibility, uh, geographic eligibility requirements is the PhD in clinical psychology. That program only accepts applications from students within the US and Canada uh, with some exceptions uh, because of the in-person components to it. But you can apply for our PhD in organizational development and change. We have students all over the world in that program. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, I have and then a question we as well. Um, this is, uh, it was, this is recorded. So I was just curious, will we be able to go back and watch this over again? Yes. Uh, someone else asked that question. It's a great question. They, we are going, we are going to house this. We actually, if somebody could look up the link um, for our open house page, it should be available. Um, then once this is processed, we are going to house that on the, on the page and you'll be able to go back and watch the recording. Okay. Thank you. We have another question about dates for the future terms. Um, so for those of you who are considering a, a, a January start, as you know, October 28th is the deadline. Um, the deadline, they haven't been posted for spring, for summer and fall, but I can tell you around about when those will happen. The deadline for summer, which starts in May, is going to be uh, in March 
generally around mid-March. Um, and the deadline for fall 2022 is going to be around July. Um, this year it was July 15th, I believe. So generally around mid-July for those of you who are looking for that. But uh, we will have that. all this nonsense now? Why is this um, light doing like this? I'm sorry? 